Jó estét kívánok mindenkinek, ez itt a Hősök Tere 9. karanténszalonja, amelyben Filip Zimbárdóval fogunk majd nem sokára beszélgetni. Én Orosz Györgyi vagyok, a Hősök Tere Akutány társalapítója. Uh, Phil, thank you for coming here. How are you? And I'm happy to be almost in Budapest again. My And soul is with you. My body is in San Francisco, my soul is in Budapest. Mielőtt belevágunk, van még néhány jó hírünk, például az, hogy legutóbb meséltünk nektek a holnap hősei társasjátékunkról, ami az első ilyen társasjáték az életünkben, amit mi elkészítettünk, szociálpszichológiai társasjáték, ahol kooperációra is tanítunk gyerekeket, felnőtteket, és az az igazság, hogy eléggé izgultunk azon, hogy mi lesz ezzel a társassal így karácsony előtt, nem olyan nagyon sokkal, és azt el kell, hogy mondjam, hogy két hét alatt gyakorlatilag mindet eladtuk, Fogunk majd még nyomtatni belőle, de ez majd valószínűleg húsvétra lesz legkorábban elérhető. És az elmúlt egy hónapban annyira beindultak az iskolák és a diákok, meg a pedagógusok, hogy főleg Fejes Martinez Krisztina 200 diák, pontosan 200 diáknak tartott egy hónap alatt osztályfőnöki órákat, amiért szintén köszönet neki. És a harmadik jó hírünk, hogy ma jelent meg a Vízzel Isszuk Podcast harmadik adása, a legutóbbi alkalommal jelentettük be nektek, hogy Larával és Katinkával két tizenévessel dolgozunk együtt azon, hogy az ő generációikat meg tudjuk szólítani, és sikerült is, úgy tűnik, és egyre izgalmasabb beszélgetések vannak. És az legutóbbi alkalommal Külői Péter említette, hogy, hogy érdemes tanulni a fiataloktól, érdemes meghallgatni őket. Szóval nézzétek meg, a Spotify-on elérhető. És köszi, hogy ti támogattok bennünket ezekben a ezekben a kiteljesedésekben is. Zimbardo professzort úgy szokták jellemezni, hogy a világ egyik legmeghatározóbb szociálpszichológusa. És amikor én először beszélgettem róla valakivel, egy szociálpszichológus barátommal, akkor azt mondta, hogy na ő az az ember, akiből kellene tanítani a pszichológiát ma az egyetemeken, egyébként, hogy ezt teszik Lengyelországban, mert sosem a régi tudást használja csak, sosem ragad le, hanem folyamatosan megújul. Van egy sorozat, a Pszichológia Mindenkinek sorozat, ami megjelent magyarul is néhány évvel ezelőtt. Ezt kb. 40-szer dolgozta át Phil, ami azt hiszem állások is lehetünk neki, meg azért fantasztikus, mert tényleg a legfrissebb tudás van benne folyamatosan. A hősötérével közös létünk alapja tulajdonképpen a Stanfordi börtönkísérlet, amiről két évvel ezelőtt cikkek jelentek meg, és mi ma is szóval fogunk erről beszélni. De a lényeg mégis az, hogy Zimbardo professzor kutatásaiból kiderült az, ez alapján, a kísérlet alapján is, hogy kis túlzással talán, de mindenkiből kihozható egy nagyon rossz ember. És egyébként 2003 óta őt pont ez, ennek az ellenkezője foglalkoztatja, hogy is, vagyis az, hogy ha ez igaz, hogy mindenkiből kihozható egy rossz ember, vajon igaz-e az is, hogy kihozható egy jó ember és egy jobb ember? És hát igaz, és a kérdés az az, hogy ezt hogyan tudjuk elérni, hogy tudjuk megcsinálni, erre született meg a Heroic Imagination projekt, ez a hétköznapi hősiesség modellje, és tulajdonképpen ezt a modellt hoztuk el Magyarországra mi közösen, és ezzel dolgozunk most már 7 éve a hősök terében minden nap gyakorlatilag. Aztán azt, ahogy így olvasgattam, arra, arra gondoltam, hogy ha nagyon bátor vagyok, akkor az időperspektíva lényegét, amiről ma fogunk beszélgetni, röviden lehet, hogy úgy lehetne összefoglalni, hogy Engedjük el a múltat, éljük meg a jelent, és teremtsünk egy jobb jövőt. De valószínűleg nem érdemes így összefoglalni, mert a dolog nem ilyen egyszerű. Az biztos, hogy érdemes megértenünk a saját viselkedésünket és a viszonyunkat az időhöz. És az is, hogy hova vezet, ha úgy gondolkozunk, vagy így gondolkozunk. És hogy miért érdemes most a COVID idején erről többet tudnunk, és hogy alakíthatjuk át saját viszonyunkat a múlthoz, a jelenhez, meg a jövőhöz, hogy hassunk a körülöttünk élőkre, hogy ez mindannyiunkat előre vigyen, szóval erről akarunk Zimbardo professzorral ma beszélgetni főleg. És abban maradtunk, hogy ő most egy ilyen kis intro előadást tart nektek, ennek az egész idő perspektíva modellnek a hátteréről, úgyhogy én át is adom neked a szót, Phil. És jó, hogy itt vagy. So, I'm happy to be here. <clears throat> so um, I want to talk today, I want to share ideas about something I've been doing for a number of years, but it's still a relatively new concept in psychology. It is the psychology of time perspective. 
It's the psychology of how every one of us partitions our consciousness, our experiences into different zones or different categories. The obvious ones are past, present, and future. But my research <clears throat> that I will describe to you uh, refines that to say there are two ways to live in the past, two ways to live in the present, and two ways to live in the future. And the, the, my positive message is being aware of what your time zone is, you can learn how to control it to develop what we call a balanced time perspective, BTP, balanced time perspective, because when you do, uh, it will improve every part of your life, uh, your decision making, uh, your success, <clears throat> um, your romantic life, and more. Where did I come up with this idea that time perspective is something that could be studied, that could be researched, that could uh, help influence our lives, uh, could, could be valuable for psychotherapists in, in dealing with various problems their patients have? <clears throat> Curiously, it all came from my famous 1971 Stanford prison experiment, <clears throat> which I should mention next August will be the 50th anniversary of that famous study <clears throat> or infamous study. <clears throat> um, so in that study, um, there was no time. No one was allowed to wear watches. It was in a basement. There was no light, uh, no, no clocks. So, so time got distorted. Meaning if you remember, there were, uh, uh, college students played the role of prisoners and guards <clears throat> and the ones who were guards they worked eight hour shifts three three guards in the morning three in the afternoon three in the evening and there were uh, nine prisoners who lived in cells all the time <clears throat> and what happened was <clears throat> there were so many things going on all the time uh prisoners having breakdowns prisoners just trying to escape uh uh, uh, visiting days by parents, um, uh, parole board hearings, many, many things going on all the time um, that, that there were so many things happening at any one moment that we really lost, we, me, me and my uh, uh, students who did the study with, we lost track of time. And you realize how much you depend on chronological time. Um, and so it got to be almost that each of the guard shifts, which were eight hours, got to feel like a day instead of a third of the day. So many things happened during those eight hours that when one shift left and the new guards came in, <clears throat> psychologically, we began to feel, oh, it's like another day. So later, when I finished the study, I thought about that, that this is chronological time is one kind of time. The other is psychological time, the time we construct in our brain. So that <clears throat> when you're having fun, time seems to go too fast. Uh, when you're doing something boring, when students have to do homework assignments, uh, when, you're, when you're in a dentist's office <laughs> get, getting your teeth drilled, <laughs> time goes <laughs> too slowly. Uh, uh, and, and essentially, we real, I began to realize that um, different people from different cultures deal with time very differently. Um, and so, for example, uh, in cultures closer to the equator, where, where the climate never changes, it's always the same, they, they, don't, have, they don't have seasons, people live in an expanded present. It's always, it's always positive, it's always the same. Uh, people who live in, uh, in northern climates, uh, season, we, our, our, mental, our mental psychology is organized around seasons, uh, fall, winter, spring. Um, uh, for other people, for children, their time is organized around the school day. Um, so it just got to be thinking of 
what does time mean to, to me as an individual to you? Um, uh, for, for people, one of, the, one of the reasons, one of the most important things about being for, formally educated is that it teaches you how or encourage you to how to think about your future, to think about making plans now for something that will happen ideally in the future. So people who are successful are always future oriented. People who are unsuccessful in life, who live in the present, who never think about the future, they, they will fail in life. Uh, and on the other hand, if you're, if you're poor, uh, if you're in um, poor and uneducated, you live in a present fatalistic time zone. That is nothing, you think nothing I do will make a difference. I'm poor, I, I work hard, I, I don't make enough money uh, to, to feed my family. Uh, and so you live literally in your mind day to day. Uh, whereas what it means to be educated, you always live for tomorrow. That you make a decision now, uh, and it's going to pay off tomorrow. Uh, you study hard because there's an examination coming up. You pass that examination, you get promoted, you go to the next level. Uh, and the same thing in business. Uh, in business, uh, you, you want, you want, if you're the, the boss, you want workers to work hard in the present, but always to have a goal. Goals are always something in the future, ideally attainable. Um, but what, one of the things, one of the problems that I discovered was that many people live in the past. Many people always are uh, reminiscing about the good old days. These, so these are the positive past. They, they wish the past could be repeated. They don't enjoy the present. Certainly now with the pandemic, the present is, is ugly. Uh, but some people, you know, when you ask them, what do you remember about when you were a child? Some people remember the good old days, family, family get-togethers at holidays, um, uh, the awards you won in school, your first girlfriend or boyfriend. They, they remember their, mind, their brain is filled with all good things. For other people, however, it's the opposite. What they remember is failure, rejection, uh, uh, plans that didn't succeed, um, um, terrible things that people told to, to, said about you. So, so some people live in what we call a past positive and some live in a past negative. Uh, now, as I said, in the present, uh, poor people or people who are un unsuccessful, uneducated, we, call, we live in what we call present fatalistic. Nothing I do is going to make my life better. So I simply, I simply must um, endure my life. But, but that mentality mean, it means you don't try to change your life. People, so the other hand is, uh, the complete opposite is people who enjoy life, enjoy the present, enjoy f fun, family, uh, learning new things, and enjoy romance. Uh, so these people are present hedonistic. That is, they, they always seek, they seek pleasure, avoid pain, uh, always want new things. So their mind is always filled with excitement. So, so they, they excite themselves. They, they don't need people around them uh, to do things. But, but uh, if you're present hedonistic, typically you engage other people and people like to be around you. Now, obviously, I would predict all of us here are future oriented. That is, all of our lives, we've made plans. We figured out how to, how to, what, what is the process? How do we go from here to there uh, in, in reasonable steps? Not too big because we might, we might, might fail. Uh, and so we develop what we could be called a positive future orientation. Some people 
also often well-educated, develop a negative future, meaning they worry, they're anxious that, that they won't succeed. So they set goals, sometimes too high, sometimes not attainable. And so although they're focused on, on success, there is always this negative undercurrent that I don't, maybe I won't make it. Maybe I won't succeed. Maybe somebody else will get the job. So in my thinking about time perspective, each of the three zones, past, present, and future, have a positive side and a negative side. Now, it's nice just to talk about it, but what I did the next step, I developed a scale, a way to measure it. So I developed a scale called the Zimbardo Time Perspective Inventory, Z-T-P-I, uh, that has been, and now it's been used around the world in many, many, many uh, researchers in many countries. And it, what it does, it's very valid. It predicts a lot about each of us, about our, our behavior. And the other thing I'm gonna say for, for you, is I know some of you are therapists or t ed educators. It also helps you um, to, to, to decide how to improve the quality of your life or how to improve the quality of life of other people. Um, and, and so, and, and now the, the thing I'm most excited about is there has been developed an international time perspective association. Hundreds and hundreds of researchers, therapists, business people have formed this international meeting. We meet every two years in a different place uh, in Europe. Uh, and uh, we also have a, a website, we, we share information. Uh, and so it's a very exciting international adventure. Uh, and, and maybe soon we, we can meet obviously again uh, in, in Budapest. Uh, so, so this is a, an overview. Now, I wrote a book about this uh, called The Time Paradox. The new psychology of time that will change your life, um, and so that's that's a big bragging will change it. But we show that in fact we have evidence that when people understand what their time perspective is and try to try to transform the negative past negative into past positive, uh, negative present into positive present, negative future into positive the quality of their life improves enormously. Hmm. In addition, um, I've been working with a therapist and what we have shown is that <clears throat> we can, we can uh, talk about time perspective therapy, living and loving better with time perspective. And, and you will be interested to know that <clears throat> Uh, we have been very successful in treating patients who have PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, many, many, many uh, uh, veterans of war, many people who have been in major accidents uh, have this, this terrible thing that destroys their life. And in eight sessions, we are able to change that dramatically because PTSD is all about living in the negative past. Uh, and and what, we, what we show is that we can teach them how to minimize the negative past, build up the, the positive past. Again, even, yes, you know, in many cases, these are soldiers who, who killed other people, uh, who saw their friends dying, uh, who were wounded, uh, who saw terrible things that war is terrible. Um, but then, you know, we're able in the therapy to say, but did you, did you have any good friends? Yes, I, my best buddy was, in the, tell me, so tell us about the good things in your past. And then, and then the other problem with the PTSD is you give up the future. You say, nothing is going to change. And then you convince them that you, change is possible, but change is what you make happen by having a goal and by changing the future. And we did this research with um, 
20 uh, veterans of uh, several wars in America. And we showed that again in eight weeks, we transformed that all of them had reduced anxiety, reduced worry, and reduced PTSD symptoms. Uh, and, and that's that's the details of that are again in this book. Now, the last thing I will talk about is, <clears throat> uh, how should we put it? Uh, <clears throat> It's not simply something in our head, like intelligence. You know, it's, you know, some people are smarter than other people. Some people think differently, but it, our time perspective can change, can be influenced, can be modified by conditions around us. Okay. So uh, right now in the pandemic, one of the terrible things are many people are losing their jobs. Having a job puts order in your life. Meaning at a certain, you wake up at a certain time, you go to, the, you go to your office, you go to the business, uh, you do this for a certain number of hours, uh, you, you, you do inventory, you plan for tomorrow, you go home, you have dinner. So it, you automatically you structure your day around the different events. Now with people who, who uh, many people around the world have lost their jobs, so, so there's nothing to plan for. In addition, all, many people us around the world, especially now in America where the pandemic is devastating, uh, we just passed 300,000 deaths in America, 300,000 deaths and, and, and it's rising, that there is no future, that there's nothing to plan for. Uh, uh, so that, that people live in a negative expanded present. And what we see now is a lot of substance abuse uh, or evidence is more people are taking drugs, more people are taking alcohol. There's, there's more tension in families. There's more spouse abuse. Husbands are beating up wives. Mothers and fathers are beating up their kids. So, so it's, it, this pandemic, aside from from the terrible things it does to our bodies, it's doing terrible things that people are not talking about to our brains. The good news is the vaccine is coming. And so the vaccine is, is uh, the victory over the virus. Uh, and that, that it's something that it, it will take a year, but, but certainly this is, this is the positive future that, that we all, should, should will strive for. Um, and now, the last thing I want to mention is, <clears throat> I said earlier that our research has shown that the ideal is developing a balanced time perspective. <clears throat> and what that means is low on past negative, <clears throat> high on past positive, low on present fatalism, moderately high on present hedonism, low on, on future negative, high on future positive. And we show, and again, all these things we do is not just, it's not like philosophers, they say, here's an idea. We say, how do we know that makes a difference? So we show that people who have a balanced time perspective or people we train to have a balanced time perspective are much more productive at work. They are happier in their relationships uh, uh, and more successful in many, many, many ways. Uh, so, so it's, so now we have something to strive for that all of us should focus on how can I develop a balanced time perspective uh, and so I can enjoy life more fully, especially when the pandemic is over. So maybe that's enough for now. Köszönöm szépen, Fir. Bocsánat, én magyarul fogok kérdezni, de Éva tolmácsolja majd, és... Uh... Én egy kicsit visszamennék még az elejére, még nem is a Covid időre, hanem az érdekelne, Phil, hogy, hogy min múlik az, hogy valaki gyerekként, vagy majd később felnőttként milyen viszonyba kerül az idővel. Szóval részben említetted a posztraumás stressz szindrómát, és egy pár esetet, hogy ez meghatározza az időhöz való viszonyunkat, de alapvetően mitől lesz valaki múlt negatív, vagy jövő, orientált és pozitív, szóval ez hogy működik, mennyire kulturális probléma ez, vagy mennyire nevelési kérdés? Okay. 
depends on many things. I mean, it, <clears throat> um, for children, it depends on the time perspective of your parents. So that, uh, you know, um, if your parents, uh, let's say, um, your parents encourage you to do your homework. Okay, simple thing. That means doing something which may be unpleasant now because in the future, it will have a good outcome. You will get a better grade, you will get promoted, you'll, you will go from uh, elementary school to high school to college, etc. So, but it's your parents that have to have that vision and that encourage you to, to do things. A lot of things in life are not very pleasant, like, you know, going to the dentist, uh, you know, a simple thing like flossing your teeth, okay? Think about that as, as a metaphor. Why do you floss your teeth? You do this and nothing happens, except you're imagining if I don't, then, then I will have decay in my teeth and it will have a bad outcome. So a lot of life is taking action now to prevent a negative outcome sometime in the future. So if I stop flossing my teeth, nothing will happen tomorrow or next week, but in the future it will. Uh, so again, what, what parents do, what teachers do, is they teach children these lessons. There are things you have to do that have, do not have an obvious outcome immediately, but you have to trust your parents, <laughs> you have to trust the teachers that, that if you do this, it will have a outco positive outcome in the future. Szóval akkor ezzel azt mondod, hogy úgy kell nevelnünk a gyerekeinket, hogy olyan típusú kérdéseket tegyünk fel nekik, vagy olyan dolgot adjunk, amivel mindig a jövő felé irányítjuk a figyelmüket? Yeah, I mean, the most important thing parents can do is to, is to help their children <coughs> develop this balanced time perspective. <coughs> Now, you don't want to be all... So clearly... <coughs> The future does not exist except here. So parents have to say, you do this now for this goal in the future. You don't see the goal, you imagine. So again, why do you do homework, especially for a lot of children, they hate to do mathematics, that's, that's not exciting. Maybe doing classics or language is exciting because you can see a chain, but you do something now because there is a promised positive outcome in the future. Um, so, so again, this is what teachers do. This is what parents do. Um, and again, this is what I thought politicians do. What do all politicians tell us? Vote for me because I will do things that will create a better future from our country and, and for you as a citizen. Uh, so I, I just thought about that now. So, so again, politicians are successful if they can frame their... Uh, promotion of themselves, of their party in this way. That is, I, by voting for me, you give me your, your power uh, and I will use that power in a positive, constructive way to make the quality of our life better in Hungary, uh, in America, in Lithuania, wherever. Talán nem véletlen, hogy most a pandémiának ebben a szakaszában beszélgetünk erről a az időhöz való viszonyunkról, de szerinted miért fontos értenünk azt, hogy, hogy mi a viszonyunk az időhöz, miért fontos ezt most érteni a COVID idején? Yeah, I mean, again, as I said, <clears throat> this COVID time has, has changed everybody's time perspective uh, because it imposed on us Um, like a straight jacket, like, you know, so essentially it's, um, I can't go out to socialize. I can't travel to Budapest. Uh, I can't travel to Sicily where I have family. Uh, so, so, it, so now here's a limit. So meaning if I know I can't travel, that takes away a lot of my future orientation. Because if I know I'm going to go to Budapest, I'm, 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 I have to make arrangements, I have to make a plane, have to make uh, 
a reservation at Parisi Udvar. Uh, I have to write to my friends and say, hey, I'm coming. Uh, let's, let's arrange a nice dinner. All of that ends. So what it means is that this external, the external limitations because of the pandemic uh, reduce my future orientation. And, and essentially, I actually begin to lose track of time. I don't remember if right now is Tuesday or Monday or Wednesday, because it's all the same. You know, there's every day, see, every day is like yesterday because I'm living my life in my home. Uh, and this is especially a problem for people who live alone because again, it's, you know, uh, when you live with somebody else, you know, you share the thing, you share what, what should we have for dinner tonight? What should we, so everything is the same, everything gets more mushed. So mm -hmm. every day is like yesterday. Every, so it and that doesn't pay to plan. Um, um, so, so I'm saying for me, I'm very much organized planner. It's always amazing. I keep, I, I, I tell my wife, um, oh, let's do this tomorrow. She said, no, we did it already. I said, what? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we did it this morning. Don't you remember? Because and it's, it's like time melts. It's mm -hmm. uh, like uh, if there's some of these wonderful Salvatore Dali images of a clock melting. So, so that's, uh, that's an image of, of what the pandemic do is doing is melting our, our time sense. Uh, szóval értem, a, a, jövőt, a jövőt nem látod most, és a jövőt valószínűleg kevesebben éljük meg úgy, mint a, a Covid előtt, de mi van a másik két megközelítéssel a jelennel, és mi van a, a múlthoz való viszonyunk alatt? Mennyire, vagy hogyan befolyásolja ez a Covid helyzet, vagy azt is befolyásolja-e? Yeah, I mean, it, it Covid does. I mean, it's... Um... I mean, right now, <clears throat> the, the announcement that there is a, a, a vaccine that is very effective, 95% effective, and it's already being distributed in many in, in America, that gives us a future orientation. I begin to think, where am I on the list? When can I get the injection? Um, and so, so I'm in a category, people over 65 or higher. Um, uh, but then my my children are low down, so they're not. So I'm worried about them. Um, so essentially, it gives because there is a vaccine which is is being uh, taken. Vaccine vaccination is happening now. The effects of that are going to be in the future because everybody has to be vaccinated before. The disease is conquered, so so it gives a, it gives a positive future, rather than every single day on the news in America it says how many people died today, how much increase is that from yesterday, what is the total number of deaths, what is the total number of cases, how many people are in hospitals, so first of all, so it's the negative news, but but it's it's. It's nothing I can do anything about because it's happening. This disease is happening all around. All I can do is wear a mask, do social distancing, and stay in my home. Uh, mm -hmm. but, so I'm saying the psychology of vaccination is that vaccination gives us a new positive future orientation. Mm -hmm. Okay, somebody asked you to... I recently read an article in The Economist saying that mindfulness meditation has become completely unless in COVID because bringing in the present is not value. We are too overwhelmed by the present. Instead, the value of anticipation, expecting some new experience has grown a lot. Sorry for my English. We look at past, present and future differently. What do you think about this? Yeah, it's, I mean, I don't know if there's research on that, but uh, I mean, essentially it's a lot of, <clears throat> so, so really the bottom line now is <clears throat> to ask each person, what do you do every day from the time you wake up to the time you go to sleep? Uh, how do you fill up these 12 hours? Um, and, you know, so again, 
it should be, you it should be, first of all, focus on my health. You should be exercising. And many people who start doing it, stop. Because you don't, you don't see any immediate change. Uh, you should be contacting friends and relatives by Zoom. Uh, and some people do it and then, you know, the people you're talking, connecting with, they don't have anything interesting or positive to say. So, so what's happening is <clears throat> um, that, that for many, many people, the quality of the everyday life is not diminished, it's just, it's, it's um, being shredded away. That, that there's nothing to look forward to. I mean, so again, it's, you know, if you, in the past, you're working at a job. If you didn't like the job, you look forward to the weekend, Saturday and Sunday, when you could be with your friends, you could go, go to a sports event, you could go to the bar, you could go to a salon. Um, so, so those are things we take for granted. We used to take for granted. What I'm saying now is because there's no, no future, that is each day is like yesterday, each yesterday is like tomorrow. So you don't plan, you don't, you don't organize your life around, I gotta do this in order to, in order to get, get that, that thing done. Um, and, and so it's, it's the quality of our life the pandemic has influenced not only our physical body, but our psychological body. And, and for me, it's, 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 it, it has depressed it. That is, we don't plan for the future. We don't have, you know, you said mindfulness. We, we, we don't have, we're not optimistic until, the, until with the vaccine. What we have now, we've never had before, is we have the technology, the technology of the Zoom. So essentially, it's, you should be in touch regularly with friends and family. Uh, and them, them boosting your positive sense and you boosting theirs. Az emberekből ez a COVID helyzet inkább kihozza azt, hogy ha időt adunk a másiknak is, és szánunk arra időt, hogy segítsünk neki, akkor azt mondod, hogy mindenkiből kihozza a, a jobbikényét, a segítőkészebbik részét. I don't know. I mean, again, a lot of these questions are really provocative, and provocative questions are the start of research. So, <laughs> so again, the point is, when you, some questions you say, we know the answer because we have done this research. Sometimes it's it's provocative, you know, like, you know, the thing you just raised, will children's time perspective change in the pandemic? So that's a provocative question for which there is no answer. Um, and so that, so for, again, that would be a positive thing that comes out of the pandemic if people began to do research on some of these issues. Uh, and so, what, you know, what it means to be a psychological research is to take interesting questions that we all have and say, let's get the evidence. So it's not my opinion, oh, Phil Zimbardo is very famous. What does he think? Well. What I think doesn't matter. What matters is the evidence on which I base my thinking. És szociálpszichológusként mit gondolsz, hogy ebben a helyzetben egyébként mi a legfontosabb jelenség már, mint a COVID, a pandémia kapcsán, és mi az, amire a leginkább kellene majd választ találni, de még nincsen válasz rá? Mert mint, hogy mi az, amit leginkább kellene kutatni ebben a szituációban? What can we do to improve the quality of our everyday life? Um, uh, so, so, so here now is people have ideas to say, why, let's try to evaluate um, um, you know, um, the importance of, we said before, the importance of meditation. So let's, let's take some people who meditate and some people who don't, and see the, how the quality of their life is different. Uh, let's take people who um, connect with others, uh, social, make social connections on Zoom, uh, and people who don't. And then what, what is the difference in the quality of their life? I know that you actually live the present. So every day you said, for example, hogy Krisztinával, a feleségeddel minden nap 
gyertyafény mellett vacsoráztok, és hogy leültök, és ennek adtok időt. Mi az, amit még te csinálsz azért, hogy ez az időbalansz, a múlt pozitív, a jelen hedonista, és a, a jövő orientált, az, az meglegyen a te életedben, vagy a ti életetekben? Szóval mit csinálsz te személyesen? Well, okay, one thing I do is I have now more time to read. I usually spend more time writing than reading other people's work. Um, so, so I now have time. So, so essentially, pandemic gives us the gift of time. All the time I used to spend uh, commuting to Stanford and coming back. Stanford is where I taught for many years. I, I now have that time. Uh, all, the, all the time I, I would spend, uh, I would go ex every morning to exercise in the uh, swimming pool. That's closed. So now I have an hour and a half every day to do something else. So what I've been trying to do is uh, use that time to do things that I've always wanted to do, but I didn't have time for. Um, Andrea kérdezi, hogy meg lehet -e vásárolni ezt a könyvet valahol? Igen, meg lehet. A HVG kiadó adta ki néhány évvel ezelőtt, rá lehet keresni, és time, időparadoxon ez a címe magyarul. Uh, our dear friend, I think he must be here somewhere. Um, yeah. I should mention that um, he is publishing my memoirs Uh, uh, very soon in the next few months in Hungarian. Ha már az egész életművedet említetted, meg a gyerekkorodat is, és közben úgy érzem, hogy elég sokan vannak itt olyanok, akik gyerekekkel foglalkoznak, hogy a kérdésben nem az, hogy amikor te gyerek voltál, most már tudjuk, hova jutottál, 87 éves korodra, amihez gratulálunk, de amikor te gyerek voltál, akkor hogy emlékszel vissza arra, hogy te de mennyire voltál az időhöz, akkor milyen viszonyod volt? Mennyire voltál jövőorientált, mennyire voltál a jelenben megélős, mennyire volt a múlt pozitív vagy negatív? Szóval ezt megtanultad, vagy már gyerekként is így voltál, ahogy most? No, oh, so, I mean, what's interesting about the memoirs is it forced me to reflect on my whole life. And uh, I had an interesting but very challenging life. Um, uh, I grew up as um, a child in poverty uh, in New York City uh, with uneducated Sicilian parents. Uh, uh, n none of my parents even, even went to high school. I think my father never went to school at all. Uh, and... Um, And so, so I became, I, it was, so I grew up in what should have been a present fatalistic environment. We were poor, meaning we had to get food stamps to go to a place that you give a stamp and they give you food. Uh, you had to go to a place where they give you clothing. So it was always felt like being a beggar. Uh, it was always humiliating. I mean, to be poor is humiliating. There's, there's no, no pride in, in poverty. Um, And, and so it was, became clear to me that education was the way out of poverty, meaning being educated would get you a good job, which makes good money, uh, which means you get a better quality of life. So that's why I always focus on becoming educated and then loving education, uh, loving teachers, loving becoming a teacher. Uh, And, um, and then I also talk in, 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 the, um, uh, in the book about a, a terrible time I had when I was five years old. I developed a contagious disease, whooping cough and pneumonia. And in those, because children, poor children always lived in a toxic environment. There were just germs everywhere. Um, and, uh, and people lived in close quarters in tenement houses. Uh, and I was quarantined in a hospital for five months, all along, and this is 1939, and there's no penicillin drug, no sulfur drug, no treatment. And children had every known contagious disease, scarlet fever, TB, polio, et cetera. 
and many, many children died every day, every night, day after day, night after night. And so I talk about how I psychologically, at five years old, how psychologically I, I try to control that situation. So again, not to give up, not to say, you know, children are dying, my turn will come next. And I, I you know, as I, I was optimistic, say, I'm not gonna die. Uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna live, I'm gonna live positively. Um, I used the time when I was five and a half to, I learned to read and write before I went to school. Uh, and from, from comic books, uh, I would read a comic book uh, and then I would ask the older boy next door, what is, what is this, these letters? And he'd say, W-O-W, wow, that means exciting. Uh, and so then I would write it down and I'd say, wow. So I learned to read and write in a primitive way when I was five and a half before I went to school. So when I went to school, I was already more advanced than other children. That was great. Thank you, your story. Um, nem akarom megkerülni a kérdést a Stanford Prison Experiment kapcsán, um, amit én nagyon nagyra értékelek, és nekünk sokat jelentett, meg az is, ahogy te ezt megcsináltad majdnem 50 évvel ezelőtt, sokat jelent a világban, azonban két évvel ezelőtt megjelent a kísérletet kritizáló néhány cikk. Akarsz ehhez erről erre reflektálni, valamit hozzátenni? Yes. Sure. Um, again, it's, it turns out, for me, it was a little demonstration of the power of social situations to influence individuals. So the question is, how much do people influence situations and how much does situation influence people? So the question is, what happens when you put good people in a bad place. Do good people change the bad place to make it good, which is reasonable, or does bad places dominate and change good people? And that, that was one of the reasons of doing the study, and that was the conclusion. Bad places uh, dominate even good people. Um, and so when we did it, it was simply a demonstration, meaning a study, it was a unique study because it went 24-7, and almost all psychological research is one hour. It's one class hour that college students come into your experiment, and they're there for one hour, you take whatever evidence you want and they, they, they leave and somebody else comes in. So, so because it went 24 seven, and because we made films of the study, you could, you could observe the changes in character from day to day to day seeing guards who start, start off being good and kind, becoming cruel, creative evil. You see prisoners who were um, uh, upstanding and, and strong and challenging the guards to having emotional breakdowns. Uh, so, so the study really is a, became a classic because the viewers, ordinary people, could see in the, video, in the videos we made directly from the study, the change of, changes of human nature. Uh, so it's not usually in most research, what you know is what people write down in the article, but then you have to imagine what that is. So because, because I made videos of it and made it available to the world, people could see for themselves how uh, being a guard, having, Give, being given the role of a guard in a situation where guards had power over prisoners was corrupting, that they used that power to dominate and demean the prisoners. Uh, being a prisoner, and these are all college students, these are in bright, intelligent college students, uh, being put in the role of a prisoner and, and then having to wear a prisoner's uniform, uh, taking away your name, having just a number, you became an object, yeah, how that changed people. Now, in my book, The Looser Effect, I, I describe in great detail um, every day that happened in that study. And, and then I also talk about, we followed it up uh, years later to show that all of the changes were limited to the situation. That in, in fact, in most cases, the effects of being in the study were positive. People changed. So for example, 
the prisoner who had the first one to break down, had emotional breakdown in 36 hours. Well, 36 hours seems like a long time now in the pandemic, but 36 hours is a day and a half. It changed his whole life for the better. He became a psychologist and he spent the last 30 years as a prison psychologist in a jail. And he says, we have on record, he says, uh, I wanted to use my experience to help prisoners build up their dignity and help guards be less dominant and cruel. Um, so, so again, uh, the study has been criticized in part because of its visibility. Now, I, I sent to Georgie, she can share with you. I wrote an 18 page rebuttal. I, I took every single criticism that I have gotten in the last several years and to say, and here's the name of the critic, here's where they presented it, and here's why that uh, criticism uh, is not valid. Uh, and so, uh, so instead of my doing individual now, Georgie can share with you. I should say, because August 14th, 2021 is the 50th anniversary, there are two documentary movies about to be made. Mm -hmm. So different, different uh, film companies yeah, uh, got, uh, gotten to me saying, you know, we want to interview you, we want to interview your wife who played a big role in this study. We, again, try to find all the prisons and guards we can uh, and then talk about, you know, how what we saw in your study it reflects in the current generation of protesting about uh, uh, police abuse and things of that kind. Mm. Thank you so much. És ha megengedtek, akkor uh, még egy pár gondolatot én ehhez szívesen mellé teszek, mert érkezett hozzám is néhány kérdés, hogy gondolt ezzel kapcsolatban. Amikor 2018-ban uh, mi is olvastuk ezt a cikket, akkor megkerestem szociálpszichológus barátaimat, és megkérdeztem tőlük, hogy ők mit gondolnak erről, ez miért van, és most ez mi? Mert egy ilyen semmiből jött támadásnak éreztem én. És amikor többen ránéztek a cikre, akkor az volt a véleményük, hogy aha, a világban van egy, 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 egy ilyen, hú, hirtelen akartam mondani a szót, egy reprodukciós probléma, azt hiszem valahogy így fogalmazta ő. Az azt jelenti, hogy ő azt mondta, hogy úgy érzékelik a szociálpszichológusok, hogy nincs elég eredeti ötlet, eredeti kutatási ötlet, ezért a szociálpszichológusok a világban gyakran nyúlnak ahhoz az eszközhöz, hogy régi kísérleteket, kísérleteket megpróbálnak reprodukálni. És azok nem biztos, hogy ugyanazt az eredményt hozzák ki. És, és például volt a, ezzel kapcsolatban is azt hiszem egy, egy angol vagy francia próbálkozás jó néhány évvel ezelőtt, amikor embereket hasonló helyzetbe hoztak, de a keretezése, a történet a dolognak az egy tévésó volt, egy reality show volt, és ugye az egy teljesen más szituációt eredményez, mint az, amikor, amikor még soha nem volt ilyen előzménye, egy ilyen kísérletnek. Szóval azt hiszem, talán fontos ezt is tudni, hogy a szociálpszichológus szakmában az az érzés, hogy, hogy nincs eredeti ötlet, és ezért valamihez megpróbálnak hozzányúlni szociálpszichológusok, de az bizony nem biztos, hogy azt ma már ugyanúgy meg lehet csinálni, mint ahogy akkor, 50 évvel ezelőtt. Ha... Um, yeah, I mean, what's important now is... <clears throat> Uh, in addition to my study, slightly earlier was an experiment by Stanley Milgram called Blind Obedience to Authority, in which he showed that the majority of people would deliver painful electric shock to a stranger because an authority commanded them to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, and his study on blind obedience to authority and mine are, are like uh, twin studies on the power of the situation. But, but since that, now also Milgram made a movie of his, his study called Obedience. And in the movie, you could see the pain of the person saying, I don't want to go on, I don't want to, and the authority says, you must go on, you must deliver the shock. And so his research was the first to say, it's unethical that people are not 
should not be put on extreme stress uh, in any experiment. And then in my study, it was even worse because of extreme stress, not for one hour, but for day, day, day. So n n right now in, in all of psychology, uh, you cannot do any research which puts participants under stress. You can't even have them imagine a stressful situation. So for example, suppose I wanted to study the psychology of forgiveness. And I, I tell you as a participant, imagine that something terrible has happened to you. And for example, you were raped. And now the, we have caught the rapist and he wants, he, he says he is sorry. He says he wants you to forgive him. So the research is gonna be on different ways of asking the person to forgive them. So, and there's, for example, there's no research on the psychology of forgiveness. You cannot do that research because even to imagine if you're a woman that you were raped is stressful. So what it means now in psychology that there are incredible limits on what you can study that is really important to know about human nature. That, that, so you can't put people in stressful situations, but if you can't even have people imagine a stressful situation, then you're handcuffed. That means you're very much limited in what can be studied. Uh, and so more and more, we're not studying, you know, we're studying the mind. We're studying positive things like the psychology of mindfulness, uh, you know, rather than the psychology of evil. Hmm. Uh, velünk van Fülöp Márta, szociálpszichológus szintén, és köszi, hogy itt vagy velünk Márta, és írtad uh, ide a csatba, hogy azt hiszem szociálpszichológusként ezt azért kicsit árnyalnám, mert amit én mondtam, gondolom, és hogy nem pontosan erről van szó, és örömmel adom a szót neked, hogy egészíts ki, javíts ki, igazíts ki. Hát lehet, hogy talán először ott folytatnám, ahol Zimbardo most éppen befejezte, hogy mit lehet ma megcsinálni kísérletképpen, és mit nem, és hogy tulajdonképpen azok a kísérletek, amelyek a nagy klasszikus szociálpszichológiai kísérletek voltak, amelyek közé Zimbardónak a börtön kísérlete is tartozik, és amelyekből nagyon sokat tanultunk. Ezeket ugye nyilvánvalóan ma már szóba sem jönne, hogy meg lehetne csinálni. Ennél ugye, ahogy ő, mond, ő is mondta, sokkal, sokkal szűkebb keretek közé szorultak a dolgok. Na most az egyik támadás ezekkel a kísérletekkel kapcsolatban éppen az, hogy mivel ezek sokkal komplexebb helyzetek voltak, sokkal több minden megengedett volt bennük, ezért ezeknek a mondjuk így a, a precizitása, vagy a, az ilyen szintiszta laboratóriumi ellenőrzés, hogy pontosan mit mondott ki, mikor, kinek, az a mondat, az pontosan milyen motivációt keltett. Tehát ezek, ezek hogy mondjam, sokkal inkább ma már azt úgy, úgy mondanám, hogy ökológiailag validabbak voltak, bár kísérletek voltak, de közelebb álltak, sok-sok természetes működésmódhoz. Ma már a kísérletekben, ugye, ahogy Zimbardo is elmondta, nem lehet sokféle érzelmet felkelteni. Nagyon ragaszkodni kell az előírt dolgokhoz, ahhoz, hogy minden, hogy ne lehessen később ráfogni, hogy persze ezért jött ki az az eredmény, mert az illető ezt vagy azt mondta. A másik dolog a Azért az, a, a, a megvédeném a szociálpszichológiát, hogy ott nincs ötlete az embereknek, hogy mit kéne kutatni, ezért ismételnek. Azért ismételnek, mert a régen egészen más statisztikai sztenderdek voltak, és ugye a, a pszichológiai kutatásokban nagyon fontos ez a dolog, hogy szignifikáns különbség. Tehát, hogy statisztikai módszerekkel ellenőrizzük, hogy valami változott-e, vagy két csoport között van-e különbség. És az, hogy mikor mondtuk valamire, hogy szignifikáns különbség, az nagyon megváltozott, ma már sokkal szigorúbb szabályok vannak erre is, és tulajdonképpen amikor a korábbi szignifikáns különbségek alapján levontunk következtetéseket az emberi természetre vagy viselkedése vonatkozóan, azt ma már le kell, kvázi le kell ellenőrizni, hogy a jelenlegi sokkal szigorúbb és fejlettebb mérésekkel is valóban kijönnek ezek az eredmények és hogy tényleg az történik, hogy nem jönnek ki ezek az eredmények. 
És akkor felmerül a kérdés, és többféle majd, hogy egyrészt, hogy akkor azok érvénytelenek azok a tudások, amiket mi a korábbi kísérletek alapján megtudtunk. Ez az egyik kérdés. De a másik kérdés az, hogy a társadalom, a kultúra az változik. Hát egészen más történelmi helyzetben vagyunk jelenleg most, mint 30 vagy 40 vagy 50 évvel ezelőtt. Ugye Zimbardo említette, most lesz az 50 éves évfordulója ennek a kísérletnek. Most nyilván vannak az emberi természetben, hogy mondjam, univerzális vonások, de azt is tudjuk, hogy mindannyian társadalmi kon konstellációban, kontextusban élünk, tehát az, hogy nem ugyanaz jön ki egy kísérletből 30 évvel később, mondjuk egy másik országban, ugye akkor egyrészt van egy időbeli, ugye időről ma sokat beszéltünk, egy időbeli különbség, másrészt van egy kulturális különbség, tehát nem is vál, tehát hogy mondjam, bizonyos értelemben butasság lenne azt várni, hogy most tök ugyanaz fog kijönni, hogy így fogalmazzak, tehát ez meg egy Másik dolog. És a harmadik dolog, ami ugyanebben az időszakban most nagyon erősen ugye befolyásolta a szociálpszichológiai kísérletek megítélését, az az volt, hogy több olyan sajnálatos eset derült ki, hogy hírneves szociálpszichológusok valójában kitalálták a kísérleteiket és az eredményeiket. Egy ilyen holland, Stéppel nevezetű ö, szociálpszichológus volt. És az a helyzet, hogy, hogy ez meg ugye nagyon erősen kívülállókban, hát nyilván a szakmában is, hát ö, megtépázta a bizalmat. Tehát, hogy itt nagyon komplex dolgokról van szó, és a negyedik az, hogy az emberek szeretnek autoritásokat meg, meg, hogy mondjam, döntögetni néha, tehát, hogy lehúzzuk, most lehúzzuk róla a dolgot, és most megmutatjuk, hogy valójában az nem is az, ami volt. Én nagyon nem értettem egyet azzal, amikor az Imbardó kísérletet és a Milgram kísérletet is támadták, mert, és az indexben meg is jelent velem egy interjú akkor erről, hogy én ezeket azért elég erőteljesen megvédtem ezekkel a vádakkal szemben. Sokféle érvel, amit most nem fogok itt elmondani ezen kívül. Tehát... Nagyon, nagyon köszönöm, hogy ezt elmondtad, és hogy sokkal szakszerűbben, sokkal részletesebben, meg sokkal több minden, mint amit én nagyon köszönöm. Fél, szeretnél még valamit hozzátenni? Yeah, I mean, I understood most of it, but uh, is there a specific question I, I can answer? Uh, I don't think so that there is a specific question in this. Maybe I, what I would, I would ask from you is, um, how do you see that, uh, that, uh, that your experiment and, for instance, Milgram experiment, uh, they were not in that sense kind of um, pure because so many things, interactions happened in them. But, uh, but I think we learn much more from these not so controlled, let's right. say, situations than from controlled situations. But then how do you see the future of this kind of research if, if now the situations are so limited? and so different from real life. Yeah, I mean, there is no future for those that research. I mean, you can never, ever do anything like that. Now, I should mention one interesting coincidence. Stanley Milgram and Phil Zimbardo were in the same class in high school in, in the Bronx, New York City. We sat next to each other. In fact, I have a graduation picture. He, little Stanley Milgram and, and big Phil Zimbardo. Uh, so we were in the same class. Now, his research was inspired by his concern for the Holocaust. He was Jewish, and we were in the class in 1948. It's not that far from the Second World War. And he, as, a, as a, a student, when we were all high school, mindless students, just wanting to have a date, he was concerned about could the Holocaust happen in America? Could he and his family be sent to a concentration camp? And all, of, including me, I mean, I'm embarrassed now to say, Stanley, you know, we're not that kind of people. It can't happen again. And that was Nazi Germany. That was 1940. And he said, he said, I bet they said the same thing. We're not that kind of people. The, the Hitler Jungen until they were the guards in a concentration camp. He gave a moral reason for doing this, admittedly immoral research namely to understand 
the psychology of blind obedience to an authority when that authority's role was to get you to kill someone else. Hmm. But, but I'm saying none of this research can ever be done again. It's, it's now most research is paper and pencil. What do you imagine you would do? Check A, B, C, D. So, mm -hmm. so it's, it, so in a funny way, it, it takes away the excitement in psychology, for me anyway. Nagyon köszönjük, hogy itt voltál velünk. Nagyon köszönjük, hogy, hogy ilyen sok érdekes és fontos gondolatot is megosztottál velünk. Engem nagyon inspirált, és, és várunk majd, remélem, tavasszal vagy nyáron Budapesten a Párizsi udvarban vagy mellettem.